so much, Dr. Giza, for the generous introduction. Uh, let me start by thanking the Rachel Carson Center, and especially Dr. Christoph Mauch and Dr. Ariel Halmick for giving me the great honor to join this wonderful community of scholars as a Landhouse Fellow this year. Also, I would like, I must acknowledge my housemates at the Landhouse uh, for giving me the wonderful community that we all need to work and thrive. Um, it's the honor of a lifetime to join the premier research institution named after Rachel Carson. So as Dr. Gisa said, I work at Pennsylvania State University. And for those who don't know, uh, Rachel Carson is a daughter of our state. So Rachel Carson was born and raised in the outskirts of the city of Pittsburgh, about 200 kilometers west of the main campus of my university. And it was Pennsylvania where, where, where Carson spent the first two decades of her life and developed her earliest impressions of nature. Um, Carson wrote about landscapes and themes very different from the ones I'm researching here at the Rachel Carson Center, but I do believe that I and all of us here share something very fundamental with Rachel Carson, and that is her commitment, her lifelong commitment to make environmental studies and science accessible to the non-specialized public. And Carson has something very interesting and important to say about this passion, the passion to, um, for environmental communication and to make, to democratize access to environmental knowledge. So in the year 1952, Carson accepted the National Book Award for nonfiction for her first best-selling book, The Sea Around Us. And after she accepted this award, she delivered a speech in which she spoke about her passion to make environmental knowledge as accessible and as open to the public as possible. And this is what she, saw, she said in that speech, and I quote her. We live in a scientific age, yet we assume that knowledge of science is the prerogative of only a small number of human beings, isolated and priest-like in their laboratories. This is not true. The materials of science are the materials of life itself. It is impossible to understand man without understanding his environment and the forces that have molded him physically and mentally. And that's what we all try to do here at the Rachel Carson Center. We try to explore and communicate to the general public the role of the environment in shaping the societies that we happen to know best, whether that is Nigeria, India, Italy, France, Germany, or any other place. The book project I'm starting here at the Rachel Carson Center focuses on the role of one environmental force, namely aridity, and how this environmental force shaped the society that I happen to know best, which is the Ottoman Empire. I'll be talking a lot about aridity, so to make sure we're all on the same page, when I say aridity, I mean a deficit of moisture in the environment. So any landscape that has a deficit of moisture or water in any form, this place is an arid place. Now, a deficit, this is a very blurry term and very difficult to precisely define because what counts as a deficit in one location would not be a deficit in another location. But just to be clear, if there is an environment or landscape that doesn't receive enough precipitation to support rain-fed agriculture, that place is definitely an arid place. All right, so because the project I'm starting here deals with the role of aridity uh, in Ottoman history, I will be talking a lot about two geographies that may not be familiar to most of you. So one geography that is relevant to my project is the political geography of the Ottoman state. And the other geography relevant to the book is the environmental geography of aridity. So I will talk very briefly about both of them, especially because most of the audience here are not very familiar with the region I'm working on. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about them and then discuss why it is very important for us to pay attention to how the two geographies interacted with each other over time. Okay? So without further ado, I will start with the first geography relevant to my book project, and that is the political geography of the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman state um, emerged around the year 1300 on the eastern periphery 
of the city of Constantinople, what now we call Istanbul. And back then, around the year 1300, Constantinople was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, or the Byzantine Empire. And back then, around the year 1300, we cannot really call the Ottoman Empire an empire. And we cannot even call it a state. It was simply a dot on the map. What we normally call the Ottomans in this time period, around 1300, we call them a principality. And by a principality, we mean a group of people ruled by a prince. And in the Ottoman context, that prince always and always belonged to the household of Osman, the founder of the Ottoman household. So this is how the political landscape looked like around the year 1300. Now, let me fast forward 200 years later, around the year 1500. This is how the political map of the region would look like. So we see that the Ottoman principality was transformed into a world power. It swallowed, swallowed up the Byzantine Empire, made Constantinople its political capital, and very important for the purpose of my project, it came to control the two bases of Byzantine power, the Balkans in southeastern Europe and western Anatolia at the western edge of the, Europe, of the Asian continent. And you see here in the purple line, these are the boundaries of the Ottoman state around the year 1500. At the center of it is the political capital, and you realize the capital had two wings. The western wing was the Balkans, and the eastern wing was western Anatolia. So this is all I need to explain about the political geography of the region, especially for those who are not specialized in this part of the world. The most important thing I want you to keep in mind is that the Ottoman state, in the first 200 years of its history, evolved in this part of the world, between the Balkans and Western Anatolia. All right? So this is the political geography of the project. Now, let me talk very briefly about the environmental geography of the project. So this map shows the amount of rainfall that the Middle East receives uh, every year. The darker the region, the more rainfall the region receives. The lighter the region, the less rainfall. And my map, unfortunately, misses the precipitation data for the Balkans, which is very central to my project. But just keep in mind, you can copy-paste the patterns you see here to most of the Balkans. Most of the, the, most of the Balkans, for the most part, received more than 600 millimeters of rainfall per year. And that was plenty enough for most farmers in the Balkans to practice dry farming or rain-fed agriculture, similar to the system of farming that predominated in Western Anatolia and actually even in Germany as well. Okay? Now, if we look closely at this map, the map of uh, precipitation, we will find out about a major trend that comes out of this map. The major trend that I want you to pay attention to is that aridity in the, in the Middle East is not universal. It is very partial, and it increases from north to south, all right? So if you lived in Istanbul in the 16th century, and you wanted to travel to the south, say to the Persian Gulf over here, or to the Red Sea over here, what you'll notice as you travel to the south, that the landscape around you will become drier and drier. And the reason that aridity increases in the Middle East from north to south there are many reasons that shape this trend. I will mention only two of them. So one reason that aridity increases in a southerly direction in the Middle East has a lot to do with latitude. And by latitude, I mean, as you travel south in the Middle East, you get closer to the equator. The closer to the equator you get, the higher the temperature and the stronger the impact of evaporation is on water resources. And as a result, the western regions of the Middle East end up being much drier than the northern regions. The northern regions are much more temperate. They have much more rainfall. So this is one factor that controls the trend of increased aridity in a southerly direction in the Middle East. The other factor is altitude. And by altitude, I mean by geological accident, most mountain chains in the Middle East are located in the northern parts of the region. And as we, most of us know, Living not too far away from the Alps, mountains, one of their main jobs is to trigger precipitation. And as a result, because most mountain chains are located in the northern parts of the Middle East, they divert most of the rainfall to the northern regions. 
the mountain chains of the south are much more limited in extent, and as a result, they leave the southern parts of the Middle East much more arid and much drier than anything that you would encounter in the, in the north. Right? So this is the most important thing I wanted to mention about the environmental setting of aridity and precipitation. The big takeaway from here is that we normally think of the Middle East as universally arid, but that's not the case. Aridity is very partial in the Middle East, and it, is, it increases generally from north to the south. All right? So um, that, um, by, by now, I hope the two most important geographies relevant to my project are clear to most of you. So I explained the political geography of the Ottoman state, and I just finished explaining the environmental geography uh, of aridity. Now what I want to do is to impose both of those maps on each other so we can draw some conclusions relevant to my project. So if we put both of those maps, the political map and the precipitation map, this is how it would look like. And you'll notice uh, something very important, which is that the Ottoman Empire emerged in the temperate or the rainy zone of the Middle East. And this forms the fundamental premise of my project, that uh, the first 200 years of Ottoman history, between 1300 and roughly 1500, we can call the Ottoman state, what I, the word I use is the temperate empire. And by temperate empire, I mean the Ottoman state in the first 200 years of its life emerged in the mild and, and moist climates of the, of the Balkans and Western Anatolia. And I argue that this is not, I'm not trying just to come up with a new term. I use it because I think it really matters. And it matters a great deal because the, because the temperate setting of the Ottoman state in the first 200 years of its life shaped fundamentally the Ottoman economy. And this is why in the first 200 years of Ottoman history, the Ottoman economy was based primarily on rain-fed agriculture. And this is why irrigation agriculture, on the other hand, was largely irrelevant to the Ottoman economy in the first 200 years of Ottoman history. Because why would farmers of the Balkans and Western Anatolia bother with the construction of all these irrigation projects and all the problems that irrigation systems produce if they could easily and sustainably and more cheaply grow their crops with the aid of rainfall, all right? So this is why I argue it's very important for us to pay attention to this fact, to the temperate setting of the Ottoman Empire was unique in that it was temperate, and temperate conditions fostered a specific economy that was geared toward the t cultivation of grain crops with the aid of rainfall. There's one catch about this process, is that the temperate identity of the Ottoman state did not last forever. Something changes uh, about the temperate setting of the Ottoman state beginning from the year 1512. So what happens in the year 1512 that drastically changes the temperate setting of the Ottoman state. What happens is that from the year 1512, for the first time, we see the Ottoman state coming out of its comfort and temperate zone and it starts to conquer the arid zone of the Middle East for the first time. And this is what I call the Ottoman arid frontier. And I indicated the direction of Ottoman expansion and the red arrows you see and I call this region the arid frontier because this is the region that the Ottoman state expanded into for the first time, beginning from the early 16th century. And this region was ecologically very different from the region that the Ottoman state was accustomed to. It was much more arid than the situation in the Balkans and Western Anatolia. So one major difference about the arid frontier of the Ottoman state that it would encounter beginning from the early 16th century is that the Ottoman state, once it arrived into this new world region, it could not replicate its economic model that was based on rain-fed agriculture because simply farmers did not have enough precipitation over here for most parts of the arid zone to practice rain-fed agriculture. And instead, the Ottoman state encountered a very different economy that was dominated by two major economic activities. The two most important economic activities for most parts of the arid zone were irrigation agriculture along river valleys, like in Egypt and Iraq, and also the second major 
uh, economic activity that dominated in this, in this part of the Ottoman state that was not as robust and widespread as in the north, that economic activity was mobile pastoralism. And mobile pastoralism is a bit new to a German history because it never became central to the German economy. So if anyone wonders what mobile pastoralism is, think of it as a mobile form of livestock grazing. So instead of raising your livestock in one fixed location throughout the year, mobile pastoralism is you raise livestock but by moving them around different regions based on the availability of the best pastures. So in a nutshell, my book project studies this process, the process of Ottoman expansion into the arid zone of the Middle East from the early 16th century and the role of aridity in the process. And my big, the, the biggest research question that I have is how did the Ottoman state, coming from the temperate north, adopted to the challenges and maybe opportunities of aridity beginning from the early 16th century as it conquered the arid core of the Middle East. All right? So I hope uh, not too many people are already asleep. So <laughs> let me just take a pause and um, just to make sure, wrap up what I've said so far. So, so far I tried to explain the political setting of my project, the environmental setting of the project, what the subject is, and what is my biggest research question over here. Um, I, I feel I'm ready now to talk very briefly about sources, and this is inspired by Lacey's wonderful talk uh, last week, when she talked about uh, oral history and the new methodologies that she brought to our attention. Uh, I, I, uh, I promise I'll be much more traditional than Lisi in her approach. So to answer my research question, uh, uh, my primary research site that I will use during my fellowship here um, is the Ottoman archive. And I assume some of you are aware of this archive, done some research there, but for the majority who have not been here before, the Ottoman archive is one of the largest in the world. And every now and then they publish a count of how much documents they hold. According to the latest official count, there are about 95 million documents and 400,000 archival registers. This is a lot, of course, a lot of dusty paper. And all these documents, of course, were generated by many different arms and offices of the Ottoman state. But the main archival genre I want to focus on here as a Landhouse Fellow at the Rachel Cousin Center is the cadastral survey. So here I have uh, and slide with two images. So this image shows how a generic uh, Ottoman archival register looks like. And on the left, you see an image of a typical, a specific archival register, which is the cadastral survey. And this is an opened cadastral survey, the second page and the third page. And this cadastral survey was compiled in the year 1552. So what are the cadastral surveys? So the, between the 15th and the 16th centuries, whenever the Ottoman state conquered a new region, it instructed deputies to compile a comprehensive survey of that region. And specifically, the Ottoman state really wanted two pieces of information to be included in those surveys. So one piece of information was population figures. So how many people lived in this recently conquered region? And the reason must be obvious. It wanted to know how many people lived there because it wanted to know how many taxpayers were there. So it could, it could have a good estimate of how, mu how, many, how much money it would collect from the, every uh, province in the Ottoman state. The other piece of information the Ottoman state wanted to be included in those cadastral surveys is uh, the revenue sources. So what were the revenue sources of each province it came to control? And again, the reason is very similar. It wanted to know, uh, have a good picture of the revenue sources of each province, so it could estimate of how much it would, cast, uh, it would tax those economic activities on, a, on an annual basis. And of course, conditions, economic conditions, population figures, and revenue sources would change over time, all the time. And as a result of that, there was an expectation, not necessarily followed all the time, but the expectation was Ottoman deputies would compile a new com uh, cadastral survey to update the older one. This was a very painstaking effort. We know this because, because of the number, the, the really impressive number of cadastral surveys that we have up to this day. We have about 3,400 cadastral surveys uh, of Ottoman provinces as far west as Budapest in Hungary 
and as far east as Baghdad, the capital of Iraq today. Now, the Kadarsa surveys, based on the information I've given so far, it has much more, but this gives you enough information to realize that it helps us really answer so many questions about economic activities and land use practices across the Ottoman Empire. And I want to use them primarily during my fellowship here to just to get a sense of how the Ottoman state adapted to the environmental conditions of aridity that it encountered in this, what I call the arid frontier. So this is a brand new project. I just uh, landed in Germany three weeks ago and this is my third week at the land house. So, so far I have more questions than answers, but I have about 10 minutes and what I can do is to share some of the provisional findings and answers and arguments that I have came up, have come up with so far based on my close reading of some of the cadastro surveys I have been able to read with the time I had. Okay, so one thing that the cadastro surveys allow us to see with unusual precision in this arid frontier is how the magnitude of the system of mobile pastoralism in this arid frontier. So to give you a sense of how widespread mobile pastoralism was in this, uh, these arid provinces compared to the Ottoman Kurlands in the Balkans and Western Anatolia, so far I have read the cadastral surveys of only two provinces that I have encircled in red color over here. So I read the cadastral surveys of the province of Baghdad, the capital of Iraq, and Basra. And this is a very important zone within the broader arid zone of the, of, of the Ottoman state. So if we crunch the numbers that you find in those cadastral surveys, this is the image that comes out about the nature of livestock management in these two uh, arid provinces in the newly conquered uh, uh, Ottoman arid frontier. So this is the data, and, and this, what the data tells us from the cadastral surveys from the second half of the 16th century is that there were, in this time frame that I'm highlighted over here, there were about one million sheep being grazed in these two, just two provinces. And this is the amount of uh, revenues they generated to the Ottoman treasury, about 1.5 million uh, silver coins. And I have the rest of the data for cows, the population figures for cows and buffalo, and the annual tax potential for, uh, for each uh, animal group. Okay. So this is one important insight that we get uh, with unusual precision by the standards of the 16th century, is we get a fairly good picture of the magnitude of livestock management and what was the, comp the composition of the herds in these two Ottoman arid provinces, what was the most important animal for uh, animal herders, and, um, and how much money they generated to the Ottoman treasury. And there are so many insights we can glean from just a part of the data that I processed so far using the cadastral surveys. So this is one conclusion that we, one insight that we can get from the cadastral surveys, and I've done so far. Another insight we get from the cadastral surveys is the question becomes, what did the Ottoman state do to control this very popular and honestly, very unruly economic activity because those populations moved uh, around throughout the year and they were much more difficult to control than say a settled village engaged in settled cult cultivation. And this has been one of my biggest surprises uh, doing my research and reading the cadastral surveys so far, I'm not sure if it will continue for the rest of the cadastral surveys that I'm going to read, is that to see how deeply involved this uh, state uh, in the economic activity of mobile pastoralism. So what the Ottomans did to control and monitor mobile pastoralism in the region was primarily to organize the countless and small herding groups that it encountered in, those, in these two Ottoman provinces to organize these many herding groups into larger uh, and fewer uh, units or herding associations. And I call this process of bringing all these small groups together into larger uh, herding associations, I call this process social aggregation. And this is a term I borrow from the anthropologist and political scientist James Scott at Yale University. And by social aggregation, the Ottoman state aggregated small herding groups 
into larger associations with a clear set of duties and privileges and reporting procedures. This is how you report to us about your problems and your livestock, how much livestock you have, and how many members of your ho households you have this year, and so on and so forth. And by placing the diverse welter of groups into larger herding associations, the Ottoman state could more efficiently and more easily track down and tax and govern this unruly and mobile uh, 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 population that were really too many of them in, the, uh, in this arid part of the Ottoman Empire, and this was the strategy. And the cadastral surveys show us about that the Ottoman state established four, four herding associations in this part of the arid frontier. Four of those herding associations specialized in herding sheep, and one of them was specialized in herding water buffalo. I will just show you the data from the cadastral surveys about the largest herding association that the Ottoman state established. So this is the data that we have. This is the largest Ottoman herding association that it established in this part of the arid frontier. And this is, we see the evolution of the herding as, uh, association throughout the 16th century. So you'll notice that this herding association raised about 700,000 uh, sheep. There were some cattle in the herds, but not as big uh, and as much. It was just a part-time job. And also we see something really impressive, which is this herding association was made up of 12,000 households. And let this figure just sink in and just see that the dates. By the standards of the 16th century, 12,000 households, this was a medium-sized city by the standards of the time. And this came out to me as a really a big surprise. It was tantamount to the Ottoman states didn't know what to do with such a popular economic activity much more widespread, much more robust than anything that prevailed in Western Anatolia and the Balkans, that it established this herding association, which was in many ways tantamount to establishing a mobile city. Because this is the size of a, the size of a city, 12,000 households. So instead of just forcing them to settle down and grow crops with irrigation uh, networks, very similar to what uh, farmers did in Western Anatolia and the Balkans, we see a new, totally new adaptation that was just to bring them together through social aggregation and to say, be a city, but just you can move around. The difference is it's more, much easier for us to track you down and to govern you with the judge and all the monitoring mechanisms uh, because you're part of this, uh, this uh, state-sponsored herd. Okay. Um, so this is another question that the cadastral surveys allow us to answer, is how did the Ottoman state respond to the popularity of mobile pastoralism, at least in parts of the arid frontier? And the answer is it uh, adapted to the, uh, to the system through social aggregation. And the Ottoman state, even though it valued rain-fed agriculture the most, it embraced mobile pastoralism in the arid frontier as an effective engine of economic development in a harsh and uh, uh, arid environment. I am done for now. I have about one minute and a half. What I'm going to say very briefly is the road ahead. So I have about uh, six months, and honestly, the first month is almost over. So my, ter my uh, tenure, unfortunately, will end by the end of December. So what I hope to do, aside from what I've shared so far, is I really hope that I'll be able to read the, the, the majority of the cadastral surveys I did not get to so far. And this is a lot of labor, because each cadastral survey is about 300 to 400 pages. So I want to read especially the cadastral surveys of Ottoman provinces of southeastern Anatolia and Syria to see where the herding associations and all the findings that I found over here in those two provinces. Can we extend our conclusions to the rest of the arid frontier? Was the situation different? And also, um, and, uh, uh, let me say just uh, the land house is the perfect place to study livestock management because <laughs> we have much more uh, animals as neighbors than uh, human beings. Um, some other questions I have is what other economic activities the Ottoman state adopted to in this arid region? So what about irrigation agriculture? What about salt production? And salt production was specialization of the arid zone of the Middle East because salt production is much most easiest to do in, a, in an arid place that lacks good drainage. 
Okay, so those are some of my questions, and um, I hope that I'll find at least answer, some answers to them uh, during my tenure here as the Landhouse Fellow. Thank you so much for the time to listen to me.